All right, welcome back. We got another homework activity here in good old chemistry 111, and we want to go ahead and attack it and build our skills and our confidence and get ready for this first exam. And so, while the previous homework was much more, you know, quantitative in terms of uh, calculating a whole bunch of, uh, of unit conversions and that kind of thing, this one's a little bit more qualitative in terms of thinking about, uh, you know, different things related to the atomic uh, model of the atom and the idea of. Uh, light interaction with with those those models and so here we can we can jump right in this first question asks us uh, explain why a helium gas sample when excited produces a line spectrum right and so we have this idea here where we've got oh I don't know you don't have to do this but we've got maybe a little tube right um, you know almost like a little light bulb it's got maybe some arcs and we've got some helium in there and we're gonna you know put a lot of uh, electrical current in there and, and we're going to create a plasma, excite those guys, shoot those electrons into high energies and so if we think about the maybe the orbital diagrams or the energy diagrams here we you know we have our energy here on the y-axis and we say okay well in helium right our, our lowest orbital is the the 1s and you know we've got two electrons in there then we've got our 2s and and so on and so forth that should be a 2 there and so we're going to jump those electrons up right we've got the 3s up here we've got some 2p's over here right somewhere and those electrons are going to populate these more excited higher energy orbitals then eventually they're going to fall back down and relax and from that we're going to shoot out uh, some photons of light right they have energy h nu and so those energies though can't just be any old energy right they've got to be um, related to these jumps right these quantum leaps and, and falls right and so when electrons fall from high energy to low energy they release an electron we use this guy this power pack here whatever to shoot these electrons up and then this gives us light right light from our cath or uh, sorry our helium uh, lamp if you will and so what does that look like and you might want to uh, go back to your notes, right? Because it looks very different than a typical, um, you know, rainbow uh, continuous spectrum in here. And so here you see there's helium exactly. And you notice here we have these very discrete um, lines that are produced of, of very specific uh, colors that relate to very specific uh, quantum jumps, right? And when those electrons relax, boom, you can see these nice discrete lines. Here's a more complicated one, barium, right? We're dealing with more uh, orbital, orbitals and more electrons. And then finally, here's a, a black body, white light spectrum like sunlight, where you get a continuous spectrum. That's not what we have here. You've got the, the line spectrum, and that has its origin in, in very much the um, the idea of the, the energy. And so uh, you got to have these quantum jumps, really important, and that really explains why you get the line spectrum, right, and not a continuous spectrum. And that was an offshoot of what we talked about in, in class, so no surprise there. This one is, is, I think, a really important question. This idea, right, you had Bohr, and, and Bohr had some amazing, amazing contributions, right? But the idea here was that you had a nucleus, right? And that nucleus had some, you know, some positive charge on it. And around that nucleus, right, you had uh, these, these orbits, right? And these Bohr orbits were two-dimensional you know, circular, and I am sorry, I cannot draw a circle very well, but you had, you know, still energy levels where that's going to be n equals two. Um, you know, you got an electron, if I can draw an E there, and then over here, you know, so that would be our n equals two. We want to look at that first one, right? That's energy, energy equals n equals one, right? So you can have electrons going along these, these Bohr orbits, right? Not too unlike planetary solar system kind of cartoons, right? And so that was Bohr's model. And still you can you can talk about some jumping, right? You can get some ideas for the hydrogen line spectrum because you can you can say okay, you can excite this atom and the hydrogen can it's one, one electron can jump from n equals 1 to n equals 2 and then fall back down and release a photon of light and there you go, right? And so the key thing here with Bohr, right? We're going to say that these were approximately 2D orbits, right? 2D orbits. Um, ah, be careful there. I am having a hard time with this pen today. I apologize. 2D orbits, right? And those were paths that electrons followed around the positive nucleus of the atom from the Bohr model, right? Well, 
We talked about that and how it worked really well for hydrogen, predicting the, the line spectra from hydrogen, but it didn't really work for anything else. And so that was that was difficult. And so it was, you know, years later when you have um, Heisenberg and the uncertainty principle, and then finally we get to Schrodinger with the Schrodinger wave equation, right? And that was very much different than Bohr. So for a good old Schrodinger, right? Um, the key here was that we have the Schrodinger equation. I'm not gonna, you know, write the whole thing, but we essentially treat these as wave functions. And you have the um, solutions to the Schrodinger equation that give us the quantum numbers, right? And those were really important because those quantum numbers define not uh, 2D orbits. I mean, we still have a positively charged uh, nucleus. That doesn't change. But instead of these circular two-dimensional orbits, we have these, you know, these more three-dimensional, I'll try to shade this, this would be my best, you know, Bob Ross here. We'll draw some happy, happy little orbitals here. And here's my 1s, right? And it's supposed to, as best I can, illustrate a three-dimensional, right? A 3D uh, region of space, right? And this 3D region of space is defined uh, as an orbital by the quantum numbers and it's an area in which you have a high probability of finding an electron right and so this would be my best drawing of a, a 1s orbital which differs very much from Bohr right where these are three-dimensional regions of space these are mathematical functions right these are solutions of the Schrodinger equation and we can have different shapes right so the sphere is 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 of course very circular but we also have you know so this would be the s orbital we also have the p orbitals right where you have this dumbbell or this uh, kind of peanut looking shape, right? And I showed you a little bit about the shading of these. We can kind of put a little shading there to show you that these are, you know, three dimensional regions of space. And then you had one that maybe pointed along X, one that pointed along Y, one that pointed along Z. And then you can even draw the D orbitals, right? The D orbitals look sort of like um, clovers, if you will. And I'll see if I can draw one here. Not perfect, but I think you get the idea. And so there we go. There's a a d orbital and you get all kinds of, of good stuff right and so here again I think there's a very strong uh, contrast between these two models and we talked a lot about that in class okay review your notes on that that's really important stuff um, here's our first calculation one and so this is this is important right we gotta be able to do these kinds of calculations and so here we can say okay well we're gonna have to recall that uh, you know for these little packets of energy that we call photons they have a uh, frequency and a a wavelength right and remember that you can think back about this and you can say well I know my frequency which is often uh, abbreviated as new and then you got the, the wavelength with this which is lambda if you multiply them together you get the speed of light right well that's really important and so uh, remember that you can calculate the energy of that photon and the energy is simply equal to Planck's constant times the frequency right and and that's really easy to calculate but here I was a jerk and I gave you the the wavelength and that's okay because if we know this in this then we can say well there's an, a, a relationship between uh, the speed of light celeritas and and the wavelength and the frequency so if we don't have the frequency you can calculate it and plug it in or you can just rearrange this to give you uh, Planck's constant times the speed of light all over the wavelength really good equation here really really important so let's go ahead and calculate this we can say e is the energy is equal to Planck's constant if you go dig that up it's something like 6.626 uh, times 10 to the negative 34 I think it's worth noting here that Planck's constant is a really small number so please make sure that you have your 10 to the negative 34 it's not huge it's not 10 to the 30, 34th and that's where a lot of people can mess that up and the units here are uh, joule seconds right so joule product seconds and so you can take that one put it in your parentheticals keep it separate multiply it by the speed of light Right, and I'm not too picky about the speed of light, uh, 2.998, or even if you round it to three, I'm not too worried about it, right? Times 10 uh, to the eighth, and that's gonna be in meters per second because that is a rate, right? That's a velocity. And then finally, all of that is gonna sit as a numerator over your wavelength. And this is really important because if you're not careful about units, you're gonna be really disappointed because You'll be tempted to just plug in 510 down here, but no, 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 no. You gotta be careful, that's nanometers, that's meters. You gotta be able to have the same unit or you're not gonna be able to um, 
to cancel these out. And why would we want to cancel them out? Well, we're looking for energy. And what's the only unit of energy I can see? Well, I see the joule there, and that's really important. The seconds then, seconds over seconds will cancel. So we need something to get rid of the meters. So meters over meters, boom, you got it. So here, instead of uh, nanometers, I'm going to go ahead and put this as 5.10 times, right? Nano is 1 billionth, right? So that's 10 to the negative 7 meters. So now we got meters to cancel. We see what we get here and then say something on the order of, well, we got three sig figs up here. I'm going to go ahead and put a little decimal there and count that one as significant. If you only use two sig figs, that's, that's perfectly fine. Good for you for being very detailed. Um, here I'm going to say 3.90 times 10. And you figure out, is this going to be a big number or a small number? Well, this looks, you got a big old negative 34 up there. Um, so it's going to be something on the order of 10 to the negative 19th joules. Again, you got to have numbers, you got to have sig figs, and you got to have units. Really, really important. And again, if we want to be really precise, right, I, I've got a photon. So this is a photon. So it wouldn't hurt if you're just extra careful and you say that's actually a joule, uh, joules per individual photon. So if you didn't put that, don't worry, I didn't take off points. But later on, we start thinking, well, that's a tiny, tiny number. Uh, we actually will start thinking about these in terms of moles of electrons, huge numbers of electrons, and that unit will change. But for right now, that's that's perfectly fine. All right. This next one's more of an estimation problem. So trying to figure out here which would be, uh, so we have two quantum leaps or quantum falls, if you will. So we're going from a high energy to a low energy, a higher energy to a lower energy. So this will emit, right? This will give off light and, and oftentimes for light I'll just call it H nu because we're giving off energy in the form of light right the atom the electrons in the, the electron in this atom is actually relaxing and when it does that it's going to emit some light and so this one's really really simple no calculations all you got to do is uh, you know go back to your notes or, or the the, te the textbook there and you can say okay well let's go and look at that uh, um, that orbital or energy diagram rather and here you say okay well, um, even for the Bohr model, right, we can say, okay, well, what do we got here? We got n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, n equals 4, n equals 5. And here you say, okay, well, what happens as you go increasing in energy here? And infinity is kind of a fun one because that's basically where you've in essentially removed the electron, ripped it out of the atom. It's no longer in there, so it's gone. But here you say, okay, well, if we go from 4 to 3, that's not a very big jump. That's pretty small, but if you go from 2 to 1, and so you can get a little bit of a feel for as you go up in n values, the spacing of those energies or the distance between energies gets smaller. And so here you can see this is pretty cool because it, it manifests as, as real-world things. And so if you go from, you know, let's say 2 to 1, that's going to give you a big gap, which is a big amount of energy, which is ultraviolet, right? That's a high energy photon, uh, high frequency, small wavelength. And then if we went from say three uh, or four to three, that's really tiny. And if you look at that, that's not even visible. That four to three jump actually falls in the infrared, which is on the other side of the vis visible spectrum. So, uh, you know, lower frequencies, longer wavelengths, right? And so that's, that's really useful, I think. Um, so I'll let you um, fill in the, the details on that one and we can move on to the, the last one which I don't know I put it's a challenge but it's really not that tough of a, a problem to be honest here we say okay well this time I want you to calculate the energy for a quantum jump in this case and so in this case we're going from n equals 1 to completely exiting the atom so remember that's that's essentially going to be n equals 1 jumping to say it with me basically to infinity and beyond so we will exit the atom by going to just uh, you know outside the the um, the pool of, of the nucleus there and so in order to do this we just simply use the calculation this is a formula given in your book you'll be given it in the in on the exam if we ask you to solve it and this will be the Rydberg, uh, Rydberg uh, constant here so two point what 179 times 10 again this is a small number 10 to negative 18 joules uh, a lot of books will put a negative here and that's probably a good idea just the signs I'm not too worried about the mathematical sign I'm more worried about what do you mean and so in this case the signs often help you 
determine was energy lost or gained. In this case, if, if you, you're having to remove an electron from an atom, you're gonna have to put energy in to make that electron jump. It's gonna have to be removed out. So you're gonna be putting energy in. So if energy goes in, that's probably gonna be a positive number. And then over here, you're gonna say, uh, what is it, one over uh, n final squared minus one over n initial, right? And that's important, right? Sorry for the handwriting there. There you go. We can go ahead and crank this out so we get n equals negative 2.179 times 10 to negative 18. Remember, put that unit in there. And here you can say, okay, what's the initial? Well, the initial is, is, is n equals 1. Well, that's easy, right? 1 squared, well, that just becomes 1. And this one's kind of weird. You got 1 over. Well, what's in n equals infinity, so you can put infinity down here, infinity squared, just kind of silly. Basically, this denominator gets super big. If you take you know, the limit of this guy, it's effectively going to go to zero and, and get out of our way. So essentially, we take this number, multiply by negative one, and the energy here is roughly uh, the Rydberg constant, which is kind of a neat um, reward for those of you that didn't just chicken out and run for the hills when you saw this one. If you sit there and try to engage and put forth some effort, it kind of fell apart and, and boom, you knocked this out. So there you go. Really cool. Pretty easy. So again, more um, you know connections to the atomic theory we've been talking about. A little bit of connection to light and the interaction of the photons with matter and we'll do a lot more of this later, but I hope this is helpful. Uh, if you have questions, come talk to me. Uh, go see the tutors at the QSC and we'll get you squared away. Exam's coming. Be ready for it.